Thank you to BetterHelp for sponsoring this episode. Listen, you've heard my hashtag, different, better, more. What will you do differently, better, or more of in 2023? Some of you have already committed to healing from grief by working with me and my non-clinical approach to grief recovery and support. But for those of you who want to round out your healing with a clinical approach, there's better help and their network of over 25,000 licensed therapists. BetterHelp is the world's largest therapy service, and it's 100% online. To get started, you just answer a few questions about your needs and preferences in therapy. That way, BetterHelp can match you with the right therapist from their network. Then you talk to your therapist however you feel comfortable, whether that's by text, by chat, phone, or even video. You can message your therapist at any time and schedule live sessions when it's convenient for you. If your therapist isn't the right fit for any reason, you can switch to a new therapist at no additional charge. With BetterHelp, you get the same professionalism and quality you expect from in-office therapy, but with a therapist who is custom-picked for you, with more scheduling flexibility and at a much more affordable price. Use this link to get 10% off your first month. BetterHelp.com forward slash C words. That's better, H-E-L-P dot com forward slash C words. Listen, grief doesn't have to be grim. That's why when I talk about it on this podcast, it's about dealing with grief and loss in a way that influences the changes you want to make in your life. As you heal, what do you want to do next? Make a professional pivot, end a toxic relationship or friendship. I want you to have the confidence to navigate change. These are real stories from my one-on-one -on -one coaching sessions and my inspiring interviews with change makers. I'm Marcia Cork, the change coach, and this is Ooh, Those Effin' C Words. Hello, hello, MCs. I thought this would be the perfect conversation for award season. And although the season often coincides with Black History Month, Black talent often goes overlooked. I know I'm still in my feelings with how the Woman King was snubbed, but we're going to talk about that today and more with award-winning producer and my friend, Jay Phoenix, the artistry behind hits like Melanie Fiona's It Kills Me and collaborations with many of our R&B faves like Ari Lennox, Jaheem, Raheem Devon. Sustaining a career in the music industry is tough and it's uncharted territory for most of us, you know, people like you and me, but for newcomers and them having direct access to their audiences through social media and digital platforms, Jay can tell you a little something about finding your voice, finding your sound in a space full of noise. So welcome to the show, Jay. Thanks, Jay. man. Yeah, thank you for being here. So I'm just going to have you jump into your backstory first, wherever you feel like is the beginning, wherever you want to jump in, tell us your backstory. And then I'm just going to kind of pepper this conversation with some questions. The okay? backstory. Wow. I don't think we have enough time for that. The backstory. Let's yeah, <laughs> that's what we want. But, uh, we got all the time. I can break this up into as many episodes. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, uh, the backstory is that uh, I fell in love with music at an early age. Um, you know, being around my family, and I kind of knew something was different with me when in middle school, I remember listening to Anita Baker's compositions, and it just like I, I didn't know what was happening to me. Like I was just so into like, you know, how the her, the music was made, how it made me feel. You know what I mean? And then let's, you know, growing up on Marvin Gaye and, you know, listening to like a lot of the music that my, my parents listened to, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. It just like took a, a effect on me. So I grew up in, um, I grew up in church, you know, playing in church, whatever, but I knew that the R and B hip hop side was, was, was my lane. Right. Um, and I love like gospel music, old gospel music, you know what I'm saying? But, I knew R and B hip hop was was my lane, and I gravitated towards that. And uh, you know, years progressed um, when I couldn't play basketball anymore. Kind of like decided, like I want to pursue this this music, you know, seriously. And I uh, auditioned to our school, Duke Ellington, the, the great Duke Ellington School. 
the yes, arts yes. here in DC. <laughs> and um, yeah, yeah. And it, it was a great experience. Um, in fact, I was just there the last week uh, thanking Miss Gray again. I, I thanked her and Mr. Yarborough and Miss Go and Miss Moon. I thanked yeah. them um before but i thank them again for dealing with a knucklehead kid like you know me <laughs> tell him because before I, I i didn't think i was going to pursue music to the extent mm -hmm. i did um because mm -hmm. i had my mind set on some other stuff and i never forget mr yarborough told him he's like jay you're going to be doing music i mean he just flat out told me i said oh, mr yarborough you know what you're talking about and so years later you're already um, mentioning two things that we've never talked about before number one what? i didn't know you played basketball didn't know yeah, that so, at all <laughs> yeah that that was my first love um that's why i went to the math i went to the math to play basketball and ah. i got sick i couldn't play anymore and so uh that's when i transferred to duke after i got frustrated with that you know and um uh, just decided to pursue music more yeah and then at duke i thought you were visual arts no, I was a piano major. What? You didn't know that? No. Okay, maybe no. I'm drawing a blank. Why did I feel like you were vision? You know what? Kanan. Was Kanan? Kanan. Kanan. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Kanan yeah. Right. Um, was visual arts. And, sh and uh, you know, it used to be me, Kanan, and Shahid. And Shahid yeah. um, was in, I think, I want to say literary media or something like yeah. that. Yeah, he was in LMA with me. Yeah. Oh, oh, he was in LMA. Okay. Yeah. And um, so because we all came in and uh, while May was with us, too, we were the only juniors that Duke Ellington's in the history of the school. They, we were the only juniors that they allowed to come into the school because normally you had to come oh, in okay. freshman or sophomore. Freshman or sophomore. Yeah. yeah. And um, they allow us for to come in. So that's a that's a history, a Duke Ellington history tip uh -huh. that <laughs> a lot of people don't know. But yeah, I me and Kanan joke about that all the time. Like, you know, we were the only juniors that they allowed to come in. But um, yeah. Yeah, so that's how, that's how Duke Ellington came to the same. Okay, mm -hmm. okay. So yeah. when so you've known since high school you were gonna pursue this professionally. I mean, I know we all go in with those types. Actually, no, I won't say that. I went in in music. I knew mm -hmm. I didn't want to pursue a career in music. I knew mm -hmm. I wanted to pursue a career career in communications. So mm -hmm. that's why I switched from music okay. to okay. literary media. To literary yeah. media. Yeah. Okay, it's crazy that you say communications because when I went to college, uh, I, I knew I was going to Syracuse way before mm -hmm. I knew about going to Duke Ellington because uh, I wanted to play for Jim Beheim at the Qs. And uh, of course, you know, Syracuse has a new house school of communications, which they know a lot of the newscasters, sportscasters, whatever on TV that you see, they all went to new house and then uh, okay. Northwestern has a great yeah, communication. So I, I didn't know that about you in the communications. Okay. I didn't know that. <laughs> Isn't that something? Like, Look, we're finding something. out all these years later. I'm not gonna say how many years later, but <laughs> hey, look, just say five plus. And then that's, that takes care of that. <laughs> all right, so I took you off course. I took you off course. So let's pick up from your conversation with Mr. Yarborough. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Mr. Yarborough told me. He told me flat out. He's like, Jay, you're gonna be doing music. I don't know why you want to go to music. I mean, school for this other stuff. You're gonna be doing music. And I was like. You know, teenagers, you know, your teenage years, you think you know everything, right? Mm -hmm. You think you already have your life planned out, you you know, whatever the case may be. And uh, I list, never, you know, needless to say, I didn't know everything. That's mm -hmm. why I went back to him and told him, you were absolutely right. Okay. I apologize for that kid that gave you a hard <laughs> time back. <laughs> You know, um, yeah, and he was he was uh he was very happy, you know, to 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 uh see that, you know, me come back and, and do that. And I've and I yeah. meant every last bit of it. Um So at what we, point did you go back? Where were you in your career when you went back to to tell him that? After I had one, um I got my actually my plaque right here from Billboard. Um I took that one and to the school and I showed that to him. Okay. And Mr. Yeah, yeah. And it, I have a picture around here somewhere where I went mm -hmm. that day, and it's a picture of me and him and Miss Gray. And um, okay. it, that that week, it has set on my mind. I, I want to go back and let them know because they, you know, being a teacher, you don't they don't get a lot of credit right. that they sh that they should. You know what right. I mean? Um, they want to see the all, success stories too. 
Yeah, 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 yeah. And to see their kids, you know, grow up and become who whatever they become. Yeah. Uh, I think, you know, because they they with us most of the time today. You know, we were there from 8.30 to 5 o'clock. Yes. It's a long time, you yeah. know. So they poured it into us. So I thought it was fitting. I thought they deserved that mm-hmm. for me to go back and show them and, and let them know that, you know, I, that I thank I them. Yeah. I thank I thank them and um to give them their flowers. Yeah. So I, I, I would know. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So where was your entry point? What was at what point did you take it seriously and what did you start doing? My entry point into like like music industry professional mm-hmm. was uh, yep. <laughs> my first year at Syracuse. Okay. My first year. Um I don't know <laughs> maybe I don't know if this is a well it's the title of the movie. I'm, I'm sure a lot of us, I age, we saw the movie. You remember a movie uh, with uh, Jamie Foxx and I think Tommy Davidson. It was a movie called Booty Call. Booty Call, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so that's where Joe had. I don't want to be a player no more. Uh-huh. On that, you know, that came off of that soundtrack. So my first year, I met my mentor, Seth Herbert. Um, he gave me my first introduction into the music industry by uh, arranging for me to actually go to a screening for that movie. The music wasn't even done. Joe hadn't even done, uh, um, you know, don't want to be a player no more. But I was in there. Mm-hmm. Uh, I went to New York. He sent me to New York, went to mm-hmm. the screening for that movie. Ronnie Jerkins was in there, SWV. Mark Pitts at that time was not running uh, RCA like he is today, mm-hmm. nor was he managing Biggie. At that at this point in time, but he was at the door, taking people in, and he was, huh? yeah, yeah. It was, it was a lot of people was there that that okay. night. Joe was there, uh, like I said, SWV. A lot of them were there, and um, so I was like, wow, I'm sitting here amongst yeah. all, that. not knowing that I don't want to be a player no more was going to come out and all mm-hmm. this other stuff, and uh, just a kid, you know, my freshman. Year, most of them didn't know I was a freshman in college, whatever. I just stayed mm-hmm. to my and um but that was my first introduction into the music industry okay yeah any upsets <clears throat> excuse me any upsets or challenges in those early year, early years mm-hmm. for breaking in um i would say no because during those early years i was just focused on learning as much as i could okay um yeah i i just if any challenges that i faced was uh it was more so equipment related. Okay. I had, yeah. Well, you know, in the early years, um, I, when I started over, I think I started off on a keyboard. Um, I didn't actually, I didn't have a keyboard in Mr. Yarborough's room. I just used the keyboard that he had at that time. It was in Sonic and mm-hmm. I, I had to use it sparingly because he had classes to attend to, you know mm-hmm. what I mean? So I couldn't use it like that um and then i got my first major piece of equipment my mom got it for me when i was i believe it, i was a sophomore junior in college okay and uh it was you know two major pieces and i started doing tracks on that and then when i met my mentor i had access to a full blown out studio okay and so yeah so back doing then i was more focused on learning all that i could learning how to mm-hmm. make in the studio um the the answer to your question that stuff didn't start coming until later on okay (laughs) (laughs) until later on uh after i i i had uh you know gone a little bit of you know um traction and success in the industry okay um, before i even before melanie stuff even came out you know what i mean um yeah, so that stuff happened. So it, it 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 progressed as years came, you know, and and mm-hmm. and that to get up to a certain point. It's like, okay, yeah, I'm doing tracks. I'm I'm now getting my feet wet and I'm moving a certain way. Mm-hmm. Um, you start wondering, like, okay, when is my break going to come? Okay. But I kept my eye on the prize, and I didn't focus on that. I just focused on me just continue to learn and get better. And then I saw a little, I saw, I saw progression marks mm-hmm. and, and just, I was like, you know what? I'm better than I was last year. Mm-hmm. 
and I start I started noticing that like mm -hmm. like little benchmarks here, and I was like, okay, all right. And then I got a placement here. Got my, somebody actually paid me for my music. I was like, oh, okay, okay, all right. So I started seeing more. You remember who that was or what that project was? Actually, uh, Marsh, I'm, I'm gonna be honest. Um, some of the tracks that I got paid for by major labels hadn't even come out. Mm -hmm. The act was signed, everything. Um, that's why with a lot of artists, I, I try to tell them like getting signed is cute, but that's the only the beginning of your journey. Yeah, because you have to win that whole building, and there is such a thing as getting signed and never seeing the light of day. Yeah, which happened a few times to some projects that I was worked on. Uh, one of the best experiences uh, in those early years was uh, Matthew Knowles, Beyonce's father. Okay. Uh, he had paid me for a track I did for a girl group he had at the time. Okay. And they were three former Houston uh, Rockets cheerleaders who they were singers and they had a singing group. Um, so uh, I remember that. That was one of the good early experiences that I had. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, so a few, few years of going through that where the artists you know, doesn't get released, then that means your music doesn't get released. But because you sign, you know, the production um, yeah. agreement, that means you can't use that music for anything else. So it's kind of like, okay. yeah. So you are gaining credibility. You mm -hmm. are making money. It's just that your work made, made, really made, 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 made a little money. <laughs> 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 but your projects don't really see the light of day. The projects don't see the light of day. So okay. that be front and in front end and back end advance, you know, it's not enough because you're not seeing any residuals off of that because the music music is never released. Yeah. Okay. You know what I mean? Um, so that means don't quit your day job. You know, you're grateful for that, but you gotta have other things you're doing. Yeah. To to go along with that. And are you, you still know? in college at this point? Uh Actually, after I finished college, I didn't go directly into music full time because mm -hmm. uh, I went to college for IT. Okay. And I did that for like a year after I finished college. I knew that wasn't it. Um, I, so I did that for a year. And after that, I got a call from a buddy of mine uh, who happened to be Jill Scott's music director at the time. He had an a, a opportunity to come up for another a gig that was going on tour with, I don't know if you remember a rock artist named Melissa Etheridge and yeah. Meredith Brooks and then things. Mm -hmm. I was on that tour with them. So he called me to play keys on that. So I did that. So I was on the road for um before the production stuff really started kicking off. Okay. Yeah. All right. So you're traveling the world at least. I well, with that, we were mainly in the in the States, but yeah, did did some traveling. Okay. Um, it was great experience. It was a great experience to be on a tour bus. Yeah. You know, um, the fly over all over. It, it, the only place we went out of the country was Canada. We went to Toronto. Okay. Um, but yeah, that was my first major tour. And so um, to see the music industry from that side was, was a, was an experience in itself as well. Absolutely. Cause everybody here, we are getting good government jobs. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, there's nothing wrong with that. You know, <laughs> or trying to, or trying there, to. You there know, that there was, were times where I wish I was like, that. should I have done that? Like, you know, you know, Jay, I've never worked for the government. Wow. No. So I, I say that, but, wow. you know, speaking of eye on the prize, you know, that was for a lot of us, the good government job was our prize. Yeah. And, yeah. um, and, yeah. and, and at that point, it sounds like you are working in the music industry, but do you know? what the prize looks like what are you what are you trying to accomplish at that point was it to get to, to be in music production and actually you know make some hits so at that time it was it, it was uh it's totally different now than you know it was then back then yeah it was like okay i need to get these these tracks placed on this artist you know so you would chasing to try and get your music placed on particular artists and then leading to production deals and things like that. Okay. And so that's the trajectory I was on then. Okay. And then fast forward, um, that's when I was like, you know what? 
that's not where it is. Because I started looking at the producers who made a a, a mark. Mm-hmm. Your Teddy Rileys, your mm-hmm. your your Neptunes, you know, um, mm-hmm. or Pharrell went off and did his own thing. The Neptunes, mm-hmm. um, Trackmasters, um, a lot of uh, different producer groups back then, you know, when they had an artist that they developed and put it, it's, it's kind of like you went to another level. So it went from me trying to get my music tracks placed on artists to like, you know what, I need my own apps. Mm. And, and that's, yeah. So that's that's that was the evolution of my journey in the music industry. Okay. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, let's pick up there. What was that process like? Having that epiphany and then changing your path, changing your trajectory. Um, that's what Melanie helped um, because Melanie was a new act, and because my song um, did well with you know for her, um, it was it, I had the how the industry people looked at is like okay this producer broke this this new act you Mm -hmm. know what i mean so it's kind of like yeah it it, it, it's it's a lot different like okay of course it's great to have a track on beyonce but you know beyonce's beyonce Mm -hmm. she's gonna do what she does yeah to have a new act hit big says it's 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 more weight to that you know what i mean Um, beyonce doesn't need you she doesn't need me you could do a boom, the pack, sauce. boom. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. she's going to do her numbers. Uh-huh. Um, but yeah, so Melanie helped with that. And so that kind of helped me as far as like people bringing artists to me. And mm-hmm. um, uh, that kind of helped with that as far as like it helped feed my my mindset and my thought process of, okay, I need my own acts. Okay. I need my own acts that I want to develop. <clears throat> and work with and um not to make them not to make my sound general for them but to kind of believe in what they're doing and help them mm-hmm. do what they do make it better and that's where um i met uh ari through a great friend of mine you know and um so from there it just it, it, you know, went from there, people started, you know, wanting to bring me acts and things like that. Okay. Yeah. So it sounds like at that point, that mirrors more of what we see today in terms of not trying to develop an artist, but artists already being fully formed, developed acts and you supporting their sound, their craft. Their- well, are you speaking of what's happening in the industry now or yeah. as far as like what? Well, well before we get there. Mm-hmm. Let's go back to how you and Melanie connected, how okay. that project came to be, and then okay. we'll, yeah. So um, I met Melanie through her management. On um, their man, her management and my management connected. Okay. And they connected me with Andrea Martin. Rest in peace, uh, Andrea passed uh, recently last year um she wrote some great songs if you if you ever decide to look her up the discography um i love me some him tony braxton oh you yeah on swv um yeah uh in vogue i mean she wrote some humongous songs okay. um but our management's connected us and that's how uh it kills me came about for melody okay yeah. So now that brings me to another question because, you know, mm-hmm. I'm trying to thread this all together. Mm-hmm. So at what point do you get a manager? Like where in your career, when do you decide that it's time to get a manager? Mm-hmm. And how are you, you know, you, you, you mentioned not having equipment. How serious do you have to be to to take these steps to make these types of investments investments in equipment invest investments in studio time um you know like i said reaching out to a manager a manager taking you seriously enough at that point what's all that like well by the time i got my first um manager uh because how would meet people in the industry was through a mutual 
connection. Um, an old friend of mine, Nikki, uh, introduced me to uh, Kenny Faracho, who at the time was working at ASCAP. And from there, um, I you know ended up ghost producing for Seven Aurelius, who was one of the Murder Inc.'s um, big producers who did a lot of the Ashanti music, all of those, a lot of those Murder Inc. hits back in the day. Mm-hmm. I used to produce for him. So uh, I was around Irv and, and Dane. The, mm-hmm. All of them used to come through our studio at the Hit Factory in New York. Okay. Um, so you saying ghost produce. I didn't even know that was a thing. Oh, it's real. <laughs> okay, it's explain real. that. I know let the cat out of the bag now, but yeah, it's real. It's okay. real. Um, ghost producing, like you heard of ghost writing, how they say, yeah, you know, right, yeah. So it's mm-hmm. the same thing. So, um, when you think about it, a producer, if they like a for real, I'm not saying for real has ghost producers, I'm not saying that, I'm just mm-hmm. using this as an example. Yeah, cool. uh-huh. Um, and, and uh, let me go back to like Teddy Riley and Devante from Jodeci, okay. they had so much work. Mm-hmm. It's and if you know the creative process, Mars, it's mm-hmm. like. It's hard for a lot of times if you have deadlines, it's hard for one person to meet all of those deadlines. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And think about it. Back then you had like 15, 18 songs on the album. Yeah. So imagine if you have 10 artists, that 15 songs each. Yeah. How are you going to get, you know what I'm saying? You're one person. You know what I mean? You could be a creative genius, but at some point in time, it's like, okay, that's a lot. And it's wearing tear on your brain. So a lot of the producers back then, big producers like that, they would have ghost producers who would help them okay. create. They were working conjunction with mm-hmm. and because they had the name name, their name would be stamped up there. But they would work out some sort of thing where you know the ghost producer would stay in the background, not reveal okay. his it, yeah, not reveal his name or anything. That's what I was gonna say. Are they getting any producer credit at all? No producer credit. That's okay. the downside of it. No mm. producer credit. And um yeah, yeah, but so you're basically taking care of in the behind the scenes. Yeah, contractually. Yeah, yeah. but that credit um, is what matters. Right. So yeah. are you able are you at least able to to say to other people, like as you present yourself to other talent, that I was a ghost producer on X Y Z, or is it to, it's never to be said again? There was an album that that came out that I was ghost produced on that um, I worked on with. Um, in fact, I don't I'm not, not one of the cuts made it, but as far as like being around and working on, it was an old Ashanti album. I can't tell too much because that's going to be in my book later on. But okay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but uh yeah, I uh I, I, I was around and I worked on um a couple of things in there and um like I said, not too much made because uh, some things were left off, a lot of things mm-hmm. were left off because the direction changed. But um it's what I took from it was the experience. Mm-hmm. Growing up, you know, um that you know, you hear that saying. Oh yeah, I was in my mom's basement. No, yeah. that's real. I was in my mom's basement, <laughs> pursuing a go a, a dream of you know producing. And so when I met certain people and I had a chance to go to the Hit Factory in New York, mm-hmm. you know, and be around all of that greatness, yeah, I'm not gonna pass up the opportunity. Yeah, got a chance to work in the Hit Factory versus working in my mother's basement at the time in Landover. Right. I mean, come on. You know what I mean? So yeah, yeah. I took it. And um I don't regret it at all. Don't regret it at all. The stories alone. <laughs> <laughs> if you get nothing else out of this, you got good stories. Yeah, yeah. The, I, I don't regret it at all. And um I actually went back to seven. I saw him at a Grammys party years later. And I went up to him, hadn't seen him in a long time. Mm-hmm. And I thanked him. I thanked him. That's good. You believe in people, giving people their flowers. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, because yeah. I learned a lot. I saw a lot and I learned a lot. And that's okay. what that's what I was at. I was after the opportunity to learn and be around, soak up as much as I could. Yeah. So that when my time came, I will already be, you know, familiar and have some sort of uh yeah, I have some sort of familiarity with 
Yeah. With the situations. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So now we are at the point of being connected through your managers to mm -hmm. Melanie. To so Melanie. tell me about that creative process and how that just took off. That pretty much just took off between me and Andrea. We had a song. Um, and so she she did the right. She yeah, Andre did Andre yeah. did the lyrics, yeah. And um I had the track already done. Andre heard it and she that's what she felt. And if mm -hmm. you ever met Andrea, she was amazing. She was an amazing writer. Just talking to her and listening to it, man. I would if she was on here with me, I mean her stories, mm -hmm. I would just sit and listen because her stories are just out of this world. But she, when she talked, you felt emotion with, you know, like a conviction. You just felt mm -hmm. that. So that's what you're hearing that kills me. Yeah, that's what comes out People, in the music. Yeah. And the crazy mm -hmm. thing would be, I mean, like street dudes, no matter street, it could be street dudes. Dude, I mean, one, I mean, the amount of people that used to come up to me, and I actually still do, actually, mm -hmm. um, and say how much they love that song is like, yeah. It amazes me. Like it, it, it really, it's really humbling, um, because I've always. That's what I wanted. Even down to my name being Phoenix. Phoenix um, changed the, the spelling, but I wanted every time someone heard my music, I wanted to the feeling to appear bigger and stronger and better than mm -hmm. the first time I heard it. You know what I mean? And to see people say that that's still their song and for a lot of people to consider it classic is one of yep. the biggest honors that I think I could, would ever have in my music career. For sure. Um, yeah. So I, I, I feel uh, humbled to be a part of that. Yeah. That's beautiful. All right. So you just threw that in Phoenix. When did you bring yeah. this up to JJ? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, 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 uh, that, that hit me years, years ago. Because I, I wanted something that had meaning to me mm -hmm. and what I was trying to emit through my music. So that's how Jay Phoenix came around. Jay's been around, you, well, you know, called me yeah. that in, in high school. Um, yeah. That's been around for forever. But that's what it was. Phoenix that a, was that childhood nickname, Jay? Yeah, my grandmother, my aunt, my grandmother's deceased. But um, when she was living, it used to be a funny family story. Both of them take claim to calling me Jay. Okay. So, um, yeah, so it's been around since I was uh, born. Yeah, well, that's that's your new identity. You are that's my officially new identity. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. I've been hearing it for so long. For so I long, to, right? I had to stop and think what's your uh, last name, was. right? Right, right, <laughs> right. Yeah, okay. all right. Yeah. So, where does that lead you? That that explodes. What's mm -hmm. that after, after um, it kills me? So after Kills Me, um, I did the second album too. I did um, Gone and Never Coming Back on the second album. Okay. And then after that, that's when um, like uh, Jaheem, Raheem, um, a lot of other stuff. And I just kind of shifted my focus to finding an act. Mm -hmm. That's when Ari came on the scene. Okay. And I uh, met Ari through a friend of mine named Beverly Price, who's an awesome photographer in the area, in DC area. She's known for her photography work. Okay. And uh, Dominique's um, cousin. Oh, actually. okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, so, yeah, um, Beverly brought Ari to me. And uh, um, shout out to Bev, if you're watching this. Okay. Bev and Dominique. Um, Bev brought Ari to me and instantly, Instantly, when I, mm -hmm. I say instantly, I knew I wanted to work with her. Instantly, okay. and um, didn't take long for us to um, connect. I think we went and started working the next day. The next day, well, give us a little insight into that process because so much of this just sounds like it just happens by osmosis. You know, just vibing in the studio, or um, before you even get to the studio. It's the bit. It's the music business, you know. So, how do you form these relationships, but know that some type of payment contracts, all these types of things, have to be worked out? Just creatively, walk us and listeners through what that's like. 
Then Marcia, that's that right there is a whole nother episode. <laughs> <laughs> this is what it's for. This is we, we're right now. So since that's a whole nother episode, let's save his response for next week's episode. In part two, we pick up where we left off with the beautiful partnership that Jay forms with R&B sensation Ari Lennox. Then burnout, a break from the industry, and how he returned to music by finding a way to align his love of music with the business side. That's next week. Ooh, Those FNC Words is an independently produced podcast produced and edited by yours truly, Marcia Cork, and made possible with support from listeners like you. To support the podcast, go to anchor.fm forward slash those F and C words forward slash support or click the link in the show description. If you've made a commitment to self-care in 2023, join my free hashtag different, better, more challenge on Slack. Come for the accountability, stay for the community. Download the Slack app now and click the link in the show description to join.